Great. There we go. And you should have a little red dot there. Is it? I, uh, someplace. Maybe, maybe. Oh, it says recording. I can see it already. Yes. Yeah, it's in the, it's the upper left hand corner on my computers. Okay. Okay. Excellent. This is great. Okay. So, um, what will happen is that people will be gradually dialing in for the uh, next few minutes and, and you can choose to um, make your video disappear for now while you're waiting or it's really up to you because uh, your video is still visible even though you're, um, you've got the slides up. Okay. Um. So on the left hand bottom of the screen, you can see stop video. Um, uh, there's a mute and a stop video. There we go. All right. And now we just have your name. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Great. All right. Thank Super. you so much. Um, this is great. And uh, let me just introduce you to the other Lisa Watkins. Uh, Greg Corman, who's our new intern. Hello. Yes. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm going to you the computer. What? Whether you can share with planner. An email list, or whether we're going to use our email list and uh, promote your content. Or just. I am. Um, I'm going to send that reminder again to all people in their mind. Like, what's the key step? 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 What's the key Strategy, the old strategy is to get them to use their switch uh, in their brain the way of doing business, which is fine. But if they're um, we use that for never really much of that list, if anybody's willing to uh, let us. That just worked. Great. I think three minutes to start with, they start right at 11. <clears throat> Last job the other day in front of a tough crowd. <laughs> like the toughest big, crowd. Big crowd. Big crowd. Good afternoon or morning, everyone. This is Lisa Dulski Watkins with the Millbank Memorial Fund Multi State Collaborative. Um, we're about to start our very exciting webinar in just a few moments. As a reminder, uh, please. Uh, mute your phone line or computer audio, depending on uh, what uh, mechanism you're using to listen in, uh, just to make sure that we don't have background noise. Thanks very much. And we'll just wait a few moments to start. Okay, well, I have the uh, time is noon. Um, I see we only have a few people on the line, but I expect people to be uh, joining us over the course of the next five or 10 minutes. So I think what I'd like to do is to just get started um, with uh, to try to be mindful of the time to make sure that we have enough um, opportunity for questions. 
Um, so it is with great pleasure that I'd like to introduce um, to the multi-state collaborative people attending this webinar um, a team of um, faculty and professionals from the uh, interprofessional uh, collaboration uh, and uh, at the uh, at Arkansas, <laughs> excuse me, at UAMS. Uh, we have a really wonderful spectrum of people and I think entirely um, appropriate to the topic at hand. Um, one of the major parts of, of doing the kind of work we're doing in um, multi-payer primary care transformation is working in teams and that starts at the very uh, you know, level of the clinic as well as working um, in, in multiple organizations, multiple regions and nationally. Um, so uh, the, the colleagues we have here today to describe what the work that they're doing really have taken this um, a step upstream, if you will, or several steps upstream and have created a curriculum that brings this to the fore uh, for all kinds of students who are involved in um, health sciences and really um, I, on some level, from my, from my perspective, it's sort of put your money where your mouth is. It's saying this is really important. We're going to start this before our uh, students uh, go out into the world as professionals and have to find their way individually. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, introduce the team. And I'm just, as you can see on your screen, you're looking at photographs of them. I had uh, the real pleasure of meeting with them in person earlier this year when I went to visit um, Little Rock on a site visit. And um, I'm delighted to have them join us again today. Uh, we have Stephanie Gardner, who is the Provost and Interim Chancellor at um, uh, UAMS. We have uh, Kat Neal, who is um, the uh, Director of Interprofessional Administrative and Curricular Affairs, um, also in the pharmacy uh, practice with us. We have Dr. Mark Jansen, who is a, a Physician Medical Director for Primary Care at the Center for Healthcare Enhan Enhancement and Development as a family practitioner in practice, as well as uh, in education. And Wendy Ward with us, uh, the Director of Interprofessional Faculty Development and Professor of Pediatrics, also at UAMS. So with that, I'd like to hand things over to, um, to the team and they uh, have a wonderful presentation for us. We're gonna have them go through their um, discussion uh, uh, straight through without having any questions. Please log your questions into the chat function, which uh, is a really great way for us to make sure that your questions do get answered. And then uh, when they're finished speaking, we're gonna open up the lines, have people be able to ask questions and we'll have a facilitated discussion. Thanks very much. And I'm gonna uh, hand everything over to the team. Thank you so much. This is Stephanie Gardner, and I want to thank you for inviting us to, to participate in this. I also want to acknowledge the fact that Alicia Berkmeyer, who's the Vice President of Primary Care and Pharmacy Programs at Arkansas Blue Cross Blue Shield, has been critical to this invitation and uh, I know would be here today. She was called into an urgent meeting and could not, could not join us, but, but thanks to Alicia as well. I, just, I want to start by really setting the stage for why we believe that building interprofessional collaboration is so absolutely critical in the health system. I think um, as is kind of, let's see. I think it'll let me on the mouse pad. Okay. I think as everyone's well aware, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement uh, through its, its um, publishing of the, the quadruple aim has set the stage for where we need to um, where we need to head as healthcare organizations, and that that includes initially a focus on improving the quality of the patient care experience, ensuring that we have uh, strategies in place for population health in the future, that we are providing care at the most in the most efficient manner possible. And that finally, that we're ever mindful of the fact that the providers, the health of the providers is an important part of the overall solution. We know that future healthcare providers to be able to function in an environment where all of these things can be accomplished need to be team ready. They need to be equally pre prepared to deliver care to individual patients as they are to provide care to population. They need to be versed in social determinants of health cultural competency, patient and family-centered care and health literacy, and moreover, they need to be data competent. At UAMS, we have, over the last several years, had teams of individuals focused on how to put together a curriculum that ensured that our future healthcare providers would be able to meet each of these competencies. 
These tie in well to the overall IPEC competencies that were established of teamwork, roles and responsibilities, communication and value and values and ethics. And these all are um, our curriculum that was developed was focused on not only ensuring that students achieve the competency domains that were outlined by IPEC, but that we did this in a manner that was consistent with uh, with improvement of the quadruple aim. This feeds into collaborative care. I'm going to let Dr. Jansen talk a little bit about UAMS specifically and how this came to be. So we are UAMS, University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. We've been around for a while. Uh, after the Civil War, we started. We're the only academic medical center in Arkansas. We have a lot of folks wandering around here doing things. We have 10,000 employees along with about 3,000 students and approaching 1,000 residents. We also have uh, a, a, an entity that I am more involved with as medical director of what we call regional programs. Many of y'all will know the acronym AHEC. And so we've been rebranded to regional programs, but we'll all right behind that say we're talking about the AHEC. So we have seven clinical sites around the state and the perimeter of the state. Those are all active teaching environments as are all the AHECs, but interestingly, we also are a clinical entity. So we see a lot of folks among 60 faculty members and about 140 residents. We are a level one trauma center, the only adult level one trauma center in Arkansas. We are, uh, have a lot of beds here, 416. We hang people out the window because we're full almost all the time. <laughs> We're affiliated with Children's Hospital, uh, the Veterans uh, Affairs Medical Center, which is adjacent to our location. Uh, I can point it out to you on the picture, but we'll move on. And we have uh, multiple institutes, each providing their specialty care, and we see a lot of folks. So the, the main challenge is you start to think about interprofessional education is that the collective practice of medicine and the delivery of healthcare uh, is time honored and it is very, very difficult to change what has been established. And so you hear the conversations about silos of care among different health institutions. Well, believe me, on an academic campus, we have absolute solid steel silos that, that will acknowledge one another when we walk across the street, but they're all still in their area on campus. The real challenge then has been to take this time-honored, difficult to change entity and really start to impart the concept of intra-professional education. As you'll hear in a minute, we've been quite successful in that, but it's not been without a few threats and pulling some teeth. My hope is in the regional programs, because we are smaller campuses ah. around the state, my hope is that we would be able, because of the intimate setting and the fact that we already integrate pharmacists and APNs into our care team delivery, my hope is that we'll be able to kind of set the plate on a smaller scale and then the large institution can see what we're doing and copy that to be even more successful. So when you are teaching students, they really don't know what they are supposed to know yet. So it's a fairly easy thing to step into a campus and say, we're going to get folks from all of our different colleges together in a single room, as you see the students on the left, and actually have a multidisciplinary environment in which to learn. One of the main challenges that you'll experience when you go forward is getting the professors and faculty to think in the same way. So on the left, you see a photo of our student environment. On the right, you see faculty members who are also having to learn about the concepts of IPE and then figure out how to integrate that into the education that they're providing to learners in all of our colleges. I'm gonna turn it over to Kat Neal, Doctor of Pharmacy. So it, it is my pleasure, as you heard in our introduction, to serve as the director for interprofessional curricular affairs. So I want to give just a little background on how the Office of Interprofessional Education uh, came to be and what it currently looks like within our system, as well as an overview of the curriculum that we've established here. So the Office of Interprofessional Education was actually established in uh, 2013 
<clears throat> we started with a half FTE director and one support staff member. And since that time have actually grown to have two directors, Dr. Wendy Ward and myself, a program manager, a program administrator, uh, an administrative assistant uh, and support uh, staff with partial time that help with our assessment initiatives in terms of documentation of all of our learning outcomes and uh, tracking our students within the program. And then uh, two staff that help support uh, our learning management platform where our coursework is actually delivered. Um, with that director's uh, help, uh, a steering committee of 12 members that included two representatives from each of our five colleges and um, we have the college of medicine college of pharmacy college of nursing college of health professions college of public health as well as a graduate school um, we had two representatives from each of those entities make up the steering committee and that committee worked for about 18 months to design a curriculum framework that uh, was intended to be entered into by all students at UAMS. So that curriculum framework was taken forward in the spring of 2015 and all five colleges in the graduate school approved the curriculum framework as a graduation requirement for students that matriculate in the fall of 2015 and forward. So this really was a, a different way that we thought about educating our students together in terms of their clinical learning outcomes and um, thinking about research practices, uh, as well as how the health system in general functions. So to complete this work, I mentioned we have the formation of five pillar teams. We have uh, approximately 100 faculty members that participate uh, on, across one or more of these teams. So the first team is our uh, curriculum pillar team. This group is responsible for designing, uh, delivering, and assessing the individual activities within the curriculum framework. Uh, the collaborative practice pillar, where we integrate with our colleagues in the integrated clinical enterprise to really think about how our teams are practicing within our inpatient settings, as well as our ambulatory clinics and across regional programs. Um, our scholarship and research team so that we are thinking about how we are working together as interdisciplinary scientists in advancing those pathways as well as our students that are in those training programs how they can learn to form those interdisciplinary teams very early uh, we have a development team that helps bring in resources and then uh, Dr. Wendy Ward is going to talk more specifically about our faculty development team that really helps make sure we know how to teach students interprofessionally, but for those in uh, practice environments, knowing how to work collaboratively as well. So as Dr. Jansen mentioned, we have approximately 3,000 students, over 800 residents, and um, this actual faculty number is a little bit old. We now have about 1,900 faculty, and you can see the distribution in terms of uh, the size of our colleges there uh, at the graph at the bottom with our five colleges and the graduate school. So our curriculum framework uh, is designed to take students' progression from exposure through immersion and into confidence-based activities. And the way these are oriented is that exposure is tended, intended for students in the novice level of their professional development. Um, we have programs that range anywhere from 10 months in length to five years in length. Um, for some of our allied health professions programs, uh, EMT, for example, is a 10 month program. Our PhD programs being five year programs. Um, some of these are advanced clinical training programs. For example, we have a variety of nursing programs where uh, nurses who've been RNs may progress to APRNs or go through Master in Nursing Science and Doctor of Nursing Practice. But regardless of the individual training program, we have about 74 individual programs here at UAMS. At some point in that professional degree pathway, a student is at the beginning, at the novice level, in the intermediate phase where they are applying the knowledge that they've gained and then moving on into the advanced phase of learning where they have the majority of their training and are really out practicing in those environments with supervision. So this is the framework for carrying students through uh, these phases regardless of 
uh, the length of program. We have a couple of activities you see described here as bridge activities that are really uh, sentinel events to help make sure students are transitioning through those phases at touch points uh, through the curriculum. <laughs> Uh, to make sure that it's really a smooth development of both their interprofessional education competency as well as their professional training. So this slide is a, a, a pretty involved slide. I do want to make note that uh, you'll receive a, a full page copy of this and the materials that will be distributed after the webinar. But it provides a little bit more detail for those three phases with regard to what students are actually completing in our curriculum framework. So we have seven core activities. Um, we start in the exposure phase very early. Many of these students are on their first or second day on campus uh, with a half day workshop where we introduce concepts that all of our disciplines. Receive it, distribute it, refer to it. So, so these may be uh, topics like patient and family centered care, cultural competence, social determinants of health, what does the health environment look like in Arkansas? So we tie all of our uh, learning activities into Arkansas specific health statistics. Um, and we include the health system uh, with inclusion of the role of the, the payers within this framework so that students really have a better understanding of integration of our individual professional responsibilities, our team responsibilities, and then how we fit into the overall healthcare environment. Um, our bridge activity in the exposure phase, um, we have a variety of activities that students complete. Probably the most popular is a movie night that we host twice a month. We orient these topics with regard to health awareness events or focus each month. So we may do a month on cystic fibrosis awareness, we may do a month on cervical cancer awareness, um, but we find feature films or documentary films that focus in these activities and bring students together to watch these and then have interprofessional conversations about how we would address these particular needs across our communities. As students move into the immersion phase, um, this is where they're beginning to apply knowledge and we think that problem solving is something that's critical to all of our programs. So all students complete what we call the triple aim project proposal. Um, so there are call for proposals submitted that are real needs within our care environments and um, our communities across the state and interprofessional teams come together to um, develop plans for how we might address that. In essence, what they do is develop a mini grant proposal and then present that to uh, peer teams uh, who are working on project proposals as well as faculty who evaluate those proposals. Um, we do a variety of simulation activities. Um, we have particular activities focused on error disclosure, immunization education, hypertensive emergency. We've added uh, simulations on research advocacy, and we're now in the process of developing a mock trial um, to look at uh, medical legal issues. In the competence phase of the curriculum, we bring students back together for uh, a half day workshop. And in this workshop, students are uh, solving cases for real patients. Um, so they are looking at a particular patient and developing a needs list and then uh, identification of which providers would be needed to address the needs for that given patient. Students also complete a variety of practice activities where they're using the professional skills that they've developed uh, in an active clinical setting. That may be an inpatient team, it may be a health care or screening event or an ambulatory clinic out in the community. And then all students come back and serve as a student educator. So they may be teaching their own professional knowledge uh, to students in other disciplines. They may be providing uh, continuing education events or in-service training. Um, but but being able to relate back to other professions with regard to their own professional responsibilities. Um, I have just a couple of slides to show you examples of a few of these activities that we include within our curriculum. Uh, these are examples of some of the bridge activity movie events. Um, we've developed uh, over 20 different uh, learning activities with movies. Again, we deliver these twice every month. All activities include a very specific section on patient and family centered care um, that students are reflecting on as they're watching the movie and then in their interprofessional group discussions. And then we also host uh, common readings for students that are at distant sites that may not be able to come on campus to watch the movie. 
uh, our most popular one at this time reflects on the New York Times article, The Deadly Choices at Memorial, uh, that is an overview of the events that occurred in New Orleans following Hurricane Katrina. Uh, you see a variety of simulations here, as I've mentioned. Um, we've delivered these uh, for going on three years now. These are very well received by the students because they are working in teams to have difficult conversations or serve, uh, solve complex problems for patients in simulated care. And then examples of our triple aim project proposals. Typically, we have teams of three to eight students, uh, three to seven students that are addressing these. They provide no more than a three page written summary and then a 10 minute presentation of their work. Uh, we've had at this time, uh, this information is slightly dated. We've now had about 60 teams present this, but you see examples of some of the topics. Uh, LGBTQ issues, um, patient satisfaction scores, uh, just a variety of needs identified from our clinical environments. And then this final slide is uh, just a, a look at one of our practice activities. So one of our triple aim project teams uh, developed a proposal on enhancing cystic fibrosis awareness and looking at the transition for cystic fibrosis patients from Arkansas Children's Hospital uh, as pediatric patients to uh, UAMS uh, adult care clinic and some of the challenges with that and how we can improve it. And that group of students went on to complete a practice activity with the Great Strides Walk for Cystic Fibrosis. So this is just a, a quick overview of our curriculum framework and examples of some of our activities. And now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Ward to talk about the faculty development arm. Thanks, Kat. Uh, so before, before we quite get to faculty development, I want to talk a little bit about what we uh, expect from all the things that we're doing. Programs like ours are really associated with a, a number of learning outcomes. Our students are building skills in the four IPEC competency domains. We're, we're effective with that. Other programs across the nation are effective with that. But in addition, we're having an impact on the culture, meaning the understanding, respect, and, and debunking stereotypes uh, across professional boundaries are really reduced by the significant time that they spend with these uh, different professional students. And there's really a, a, a growing positivity uh, in the attitude toward team-based decision-making that is really wonderful to see. So in addition, it's important to think about how our IPE, our student-focused events, impact patient care. And the research does show that patient satisfaction goes way up. Patients really like to have a team involved in their care, a team that's collaborating and communicating effectively uh, in particular. Uh, there is evidence of improvement in disease-specific outcomes or having an impact on health. Uh, we're reducing patient safety events. IPE is associated with reducing those safety events uh, and uh, avoiding those. Uh, there's also some emergent data looking at cost savings through coordination of care, avoiding duplicative services, for instance. Uh, and then student satisfaction in their practice-based uh, uh, environments, as well as provider satisfaction, our existing workforce, how they feel about team-based care once they are, are involved in those kinds of activities is really high. And so they're really enjoying those um, uh, uh, new experiences. As we move to look at faculty development, it's really important to think about if we educate our students in this collaborative care skill set and then send them into a practice environment that is still very much siloed then they be, can become a little uh, disillusioned. And so we wanted to have a strong arm of our office that is dealing with the current workforce and how the current workforce can build those same skills in a time effective and cost effective way. So we designed a number of faculty focused events. We also have some branding that helps with uh, recognition across the institution. Our uh, logo uh, symbolizes the collaboration that we're trying to achieve. Um, we've worked hard on our messaging. The email is there. There's also a link to our website and we have a Blackboard community with more information. I'll note that the colors on this uh, slide deck and on our emails are the colors of each of the colleges, meaning uh, that we embody just in how we're presenting ourselves um, as representative and inclusive of all. 
And while today we're focusing primarily on interprofessional practice, I will mention that our faculty focused uh, arm is really looking across our three missions here at an academic medical center. We have a uh, number of educators and a number of researchers, and we're really trying to promote interdisciplinary collaborative research, so team-based science, uh, interprofessional education in the design and facilitation phase of things, uh, as well as our interprofessional practice. Well, the first goal was really to have enough manpower to put forth uh, in a quality way our extensive student curriculum. And so we developed an IPE facilitator training process. You'll see at the bottom there is a one hour 101. What is IPE? What is IPCP? Collaborative practice. Why is it important? What's the theory behind it? And what are we doing here at UAMS? We've provided that one hour at existing meetings, so grand rounds, faculty meetings, those kinds of things across all of our colleges and to almost all of our faculty groups. We have just a few left to do. Uh, and that got people interested. Those that want to become educators, whoop, okay, those that want to become educators, uh, take our facilitator workshop, our 201, that's the second block at the bottom of this um, somewhat busy slide. It's a three hour workshop split between facilitator skill development so that they're prepared and comfortable to facilitate our events. Uh, the second half is event design skills so they can help us build new events. We don't necessarily have to limit ourselves to the ones we initially created. We want it to grow and have sort of a ground swelling so that lots of new, unique and creative experiences are available. The third step, our 301, is they choose an event. After they complete the workshop, they choose an event they want to be certified in. It could be a research project uh, advisor. It could be simulation. Uh, yes. They could create their own event, which is that last column on the end that's orange. Um, does, is there any of Paula Super? It sounds like somebody's not muted. If folks would just check and make sure that they're muted, that would be helpful. No, I would take a bullet. Uh, so if they complete the three-step process, they review the materials. Um, you know how we have two of those. They audit. Uh, and, the, and the bigger bowls. I think someone but still is not muted. Um, I apologize for that back and, feed. And, uh, and, uh, and so Dr. Wax, Wax, this is the, the, Lisa, let me just, Susan, uh, Susan. Call me. Trey, I'd like a seltzer, and could I? I Susan, maybe you should. <laughs> Actually, you can mute everyone from your line. Um, maybe, maybe like a, if there's a, like a Clementine or something. Um, so they would watch the event uh, after they receive the materials, and then they would co-lead with an experienced facilitator, and I would watch them and score them on a tool that we uh, have used uh, that looks at facilitator skills. So to become a certified facilitator, you do that for just one event, and it really doesn't matter which of these events the person chose, or they could create their own event. And actually, we've had a number of our simulations and movie nights have come out of our certification workshop. Now, for those that are really excited about what we're doing, uh, they might choose three or more events to be certified in, and we call that a master facilitator. And they can choose any three events that they would like. So this has uh, led us to have a faculty tracking database uh, and has uh, allowed us to really grow our bank of skilled facilitators to run our IPE student curriculum. Uh, we do have buy-in from the deans about this process, which means that they've instructed their promotion and tenure committees uh, about the value of this certification and the IPE and IPCP movement in general, which has really uh, increased the incentives for faculty to become involved across all of the colleges. In addition to that, you'll see the 101 here and then the top two blue uh, are the 201 E, E for educator and the 301 E uh, again for educator. That's our facilitator training process. Uh, the middle though is our 201 C and 301 C and those are really for clinicians. The first being how to build a clinical team and um, for those not business minded, how to create a business plan and to work with your managers and directors on the uh, uh, request for the team that you think you need and what the outcomes are gonna be that you would track to show the virtue and the value of that team. 301C is taking an existing team that may not be functioning quite as effectively as you'd like, doing an analysis and then bringing them into a workshop or a one-on-one -on -one consulting environment to be able to improve the functioning and then reevaluating them six months after that um, intervention. At the bottom, there are two workshops. I won't um, dally too long on those. They're, focused on interdisciplinary research uh, and those skills. 
And then at the bottom is our monthly series. So if folks don't want to dive as deeply into the process as the workshops, but they'd like to learn a little bit more, we do have our Legos, Learning About Education and Group Opportunities. It's the first, month, uh, first Wednesday of every month from 12.15 to 1.15. It is live streamed. And if anyone is interested, you could email us. We'd be happy to share the link with you. There are CEs for the live as well as the online modules that we create for each live event. Uh, and those are housed on the Center for Distance Health here at UAMS, their Learn On Demand website. And if you need any of uh, that information, please just feel free to email us and we'll be happy to get it to you. So a sort of summary about what all we have talked about today. We started out talking about the quadruple aim. And that's really important for us to keep a focus on. All of our efforts are really trying to move forward our patient care, their uh, satisfaction with their visit and their outcomes. Also, the population that we serve is the only academic health center in the state. We have a, a calling to be serving the entire state and its health and well-being to try and do this at as reduced a cost as possible. And then finally, to not forget our providers and their professional wellness as we are making changes in, uh, to move forward those other three aims. On top of this is really the core competencies for interprofessional collaborative practice, those IPEC core competencies, understanding roles and responsibilities, being comfortable uh, caring for others together, sharing values and ethics and shared decision making and mutual respect of one another, developing positive, uh, consistent and effective communication strategies, and to use the research on team dynamics to promote more positive uh, and sustained teamwork. And to do that, we've been focusing on all three of our missions, not just collaborative practice, but team science and collaborative education efforts. And at the center of it all, our students, faculty, and clinical staff. We do have a couple of key successes. Uh, I won't read through all of these, but I'll highlight a couple of them. Having diverse faculty development activities have really been important in engaging our existing workforce. We've extended those to our clinical staff uh, as well and have um, received a lot of positive feedback about that. It's been really critical to have top level leadership support from the chancellor, the provost, the deans, and others to be able to move forward as quickly as we have in an uh, institution that has been very siloed historically. Uh, and really that consolidated infrastructure, the pillar team and the central office, uh, as well as the engagement of uh, thought partners across all of the colleges on those pillar teams has been really important. Uh, we have a couple of lessons learned, and I, again, won't read all of the things on this slide, but I'll highlight a few of them, um, including patient and family-centered uh, family care um, kinds of perspectives on teams and committees has been really important. We have a lot of objectives in our events that are related to PFCC um, uh, shared initiatives and goals. Uh, also things like ensuring the curriculum cur contributes to our overall institutional mission and goals, aligning our curriculum uh, with our institution as well as the national uh, movement toward that quadruple aim has been really um, key. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to um, start up our uh, video feed and see if we can't get all of our speakers together. Uh, and then we'll be happy to take questions. That's great. Um, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. And we'll um, just to uh, tee things up while you're uh, getting organized there. Um, I, first of all, doesn't it make you want to just go back to school? I mean, I want to go back to school. <laughs> I think uh, it, it's just such a wonderful and forward thinking approach to to say that this is just incredibly important and uh and and the, i love the uh, it's almost like an afterthought in one of your last slides where you're viewing this not as an add-on this is really fundamental to the way um that your students are educated um so if i could just sort of put forth a, that first question sort of how um how you think this developed, it seems almost organically initially, um, and then with a tremendous amount of support from, as you said, all levels of um, leadership and, and implementation sort of uh, personnel. And, um, you know, I mean, it, not that there's a secret sauce there, I, we all know there generally isn't, but um, you, this is very different than really any other program in our country. So if I could just sort of toss that question out of what you think are the, how, how that really happened. 
I'll just start um, and say that I do believe that our former chancellor, Dr. Dan Ron, was absolutely critical to uh, the success of this early on. He not only um, basically had an edict that you will, you will uh, come up with a plan to ensure that all students have interprofessional experiences throughout their curriculum, but he also he also provided some financial resources to ensure its success. So I think for an institution that's just beginning the journey that the, um, the commitment of the, the chancellor or the president, whatever the case may be, and, and some financial support to at least begin the process is, is critical to its success. We also had the, the buy-in of, of the provost and the buy-in of all the deans. And I think that, that certainly makes the, the process a lot easier as you, as you start. Great. Any other observations from the, um, the rest of you as you? Well, I, I would add that I think uh, many institutions are trying to put together a student curriculum, but not as many are focused on the diverse faculty needs. And I think that has been a strength that 101 being able to go and get in front of all the faculty across all the colleges so that their basic knowledge of what we're doing and why is there has been really important in moving that culture full toward acceptability forward. That's great. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to open it up to all of our uh, colleagues who are on the phone there. We have about uh, 35 people who joined us today uh, from all over the country. And, um, and I think just as a reminder for all of you, I, I know you're aware that the, our collaborative has approximately uh, 20 states or regions that are represented, most of whom are involved in the Comprehensive Primary Care Plus. Um, and some of those people are actually not even yet involved. They're actually starting uh, uh, in January. And so they're all, many of them are on the phone today. Um, so if I can uh, turn this out to our, our um, audience, anybody have some uh, comments or questions for our faculty? Um, I do know that there are a few uh, uh, people who are involved in Arkansas um, who are on, on the line today. Um, Dr. Maruf is with us as well as Dr. Golden. Um, Dr. Maruf from Qualchoice and Dr. Golden from um, from the uh, State and Department of Human Services. Perhaps you have some comments about your observations watching this uh, from your positions. Well, I'll be honest with you, Lisa. I just signed on, so I don't even know what the presentation was. <laughs> <laughs> I think you might know some of the people who are in who are uh, online. I'm not, are you on the phone, Bill? Because it's um, yeah. Okay, so we have your your uh, wonderful colleagues from UAMS. Um, so uh, they're uh, doing the uh, description of their inter. Uh, professional education uh, curriculum and uh, sort of how they've implemented that. So you have Steph ah. Carter, Pat Neal, Mark Jansen, and Wendy Ward. So sure. now that I've put you completely on the spot, Bill, would you like to uh, make a comment on this? Well, yeah, no, I mean, I think it's all, you know, valuable stuff. And uh, I guess a, a good uh, colleague of mine, and actually someone I've been working, collaborating with for years, Bob Hopkins, started the uh, one of the founders of a harmony clinic where a lot of this interprofessional education has happened. And so it's really been a, a real formative process. And, um, you know, I, I think when we redesigned medical homes uh, and began to change the incentive structure for payment, where you start to reward uh, uh, folks for outcomes and panel management and the patient journey rather than services, what that does is actually foster uh, people rethinking what a healthcare team is, who does what on the team, and uh, frankly, I think it's going to eliminate uh, a lot of the farmer cowboy uh, nurse practitioner versus pharmacist versus doctor debate, uh, because frankly, um, you know, if uh, if you're if you want to be an independent, say, nurse practitioner in a in a, in a setting, uh, and you want to be in an APM, well, that's that's a pretty good challenge. And if you can do it, more power to you. But I think increasingly people are going to realize that a collaborative process is going to meet is going to be, um, outperform and be a lot more professionally satisfying than these kind of solo uh, siloed professional enterprises. 
I absolutely agree with Dr. Golden. I, I think the, the focus on understanding overlapping roles and responsibilities where we have unique contributions, but also where we have shared responsibility and a, a collaborative approach is critical to what we're going to need for healthcare practitioners in the future. One question I have for, thank you, uh, for um, really the uh, assembled who are mostly muted at the moment, um, but if there's any, uh, anything looking, anything like this in, in your states or regions, I mean, I think this is a pretty unique um, and very, very evolved uh, curriculum and program. Um, but if there, you know, many of you are involved in uh, other academic uh, environments in, in other states. Anybody seen something like this? Whether in, uh, we have people from um, New York on the phone and Michigan. Hey, Lisa, this is Pete Aaron. Hi, Pete. Hey. So this is really interesting, you guys. Great work, and, and I'm in Oklahoma, and we have certainly heard about what you're doing out east of us. Uh, some of you on the phone may know about one of the programs that Dr. Golden and I are somewhat related with in the American Medical Association. There is a, an initiative called the ACE Initiative, which is Accelerating Change in Medical Education. Uh, 32 medical schools have gotten $1 million plus grants to work on innovative aspects of medical education. And uh, a lot of what they do has been embedded in a, in a book that you might look up on Amazon I have no shares on Amazon, but uh, it's called Health System Science. These 32 schools are working toward possibly changing the medical school curriculum. So if any of you have ever been on a medical school curriculum committee, you know how difficult it is to even add a course, let alone change the curriculum. But, there's, but these schools who have embedded in them many of the same philosophies that we've heard today, on interprofessional education and team-based care and system-based care and those kinds of initiatives are, bet are embedded in what they're calling a health system science, which they envision as a third pillar of medical education going, down, going up in the future. So there's what we're all familiar with, which is basic science education, clinical science education, usually broken up into three and five semesters or four and four semesters. Here they would actually have a scenario where they would still have those two pillars, basic science and clinical science, but an overarching umbrella called health system science, which integrates how med students in the upcoming years, both as residents, fellows, and, and attending and staff, how they're going to integrate what they've learned uh, during those four years of medical school. So, um, there's a lot of excitement and energy and excitement along this area, and it really been diagrams into what you're doing in Arkansas. So congratulations on all that work. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Welcome. Any other uh, questions or comments from um, some of our colleagues who are involved in this work elsewhere? Uh, one of the things that, uh, that I had heard from you, and I didn't, um, or I apologize if it wasn't mentioned specifically in this presentation, was that the, the, the curriculum, um, appealing as it is, is also required for graduation, correct? Um, which is this whole other step, uh, sort of like having legislation that makes you uh, enforce multi-payer primary care support, you know, so it, it is... Um, that obviously is unusual. And um, if you think that really was essential to some of the development and the real um, spread and solidification of the program, or do you think that there really was enough uh, will on the part of people who are participating to, to have that happen? I, I do absolutely believe that that was essential. And uh, as was mentioned earlier by uh, Dr. Gardner and Dr. Ward, the support and the charge from our previous uh, chancellor, Dr. Dan Ron, uh, and the support by Dr. Gardner, our provost uh, as well, in saying we will do this and the charge to the steering committee really being figure out how you're going to do this in an effective way. And I think that recognition that 
Uh, so many of our programs have requirements for interprofessional education as part of their accreditation standards, but typically units are working uh, separately to try to figure out how to meet those requirements and recognizing with a lot of the change that was happening at the institution that we have to do things more effectively in teams uh, to improve our outcomes for our patients as well as our educational system, it just made sense to create a structure where all of those units were working together to develop something that would, that would make sense for all students. Um, I think we've continued to see evolution in this area. There's been the development of a healthcare collaborative accreditation panel. Uh, they're actually providing a webinar next week uh, with a lot of discussion as opposed to having separate accreditation standards for medical education, pharmacy education, nursing education, that perhaps we would have a uniform set of accreditation standards that all would adopt. Um, but we have colleagues at other institutions that have exactly the opposite approach uh, from an administration support down to the faculty level. Their institutions are really a grassroots campaign from the faculty level trying to get groups together to organize these types of events. And the challenges that are experienced very commonly with regard to the logistics of getting students uh, in class together at the same time because class schedules do not line up. Uh, shared faculty effort in terms of developing these activities where part of your effort is going to another group of students that may not be your home college. Uh, there are just a lot of challenges with that as well as uh, what was previously mentioned, having resources available to build these types of opportunities from the campus level. So in many conversations with colleagues across the country, we, we are very, very grateful that system and infrastructure was built here at UAMS for us to implement this program. And having the buy-in from all five colleges in the graduate school early in the process, uh, the support from the Council of Dean to say, we will do this. If you're a student at UAMS, you will experience this as part of your training. Um, I just don't think I can speak enough to the importance of that and the success with where we are at the program. I just want to add to, to what happened this too. This this was just absolutely seamless. You know, at the big stages, one of the biggest debates was should we should we exclude certain subsets of students from the requirement? And I think that was really the bigger controversy was should there be groups that were excluded? And that you know, the graduate student, you know, there was a, a lot of questions about whether or not PhD graduate students that a basic science lab could take part in this. But if we were going to say all students would have a graduation requirement, we had to address not only what that would look like, but how we could make sure that made sense. And, and secondly, you know, online students, you know, should they be excluded? If not, how do we make it a meaningful experience for students that are primarily online? Or a master's in public health student, how do they become a meaningful part of the experiences? So the, the faculty have done a phenomenal job of ensuring the success of this. I'd like to say one thing too that part of this discussion, if you go back to 10,000 feet, this is a talent and gown discussion before I came to UAM as a in a small town in South Arkansas for just shy of 30 years. So I feel qualified to kind of understand medicine from a physician centric, anecdotal, fee for service way because that's where I was for three decades. And I think we now understand that the current payer models are unsustainable. So what's really driving these changes is we can't afford to do what we have to do for the people that we're gonna take care of unless we do something different. And so we have to recognize that as our, our core mission is to train healthcare professionals for the state of Arkansas. We get paid by the citizens to resupply health professionals of all types going forward. In the day of big data, we're starting to understand that anecdotal isn't going to work. We're going to have to be evidence-based, that we have to have a coordinated effort to educate these kids as they go out into the field. And they're going to find when they get there, particularly in the backwoods of Arkansas, this whole concept of team-based care can sometimes be pretty darn foreign. So we have to do a great job of inoculating our students so that when they get out of the real world, they realize what we 
told them is the way that it's going to be, and not look backward into what we've done that we cannot sustain. Yeah, and as I said, the medical home program has really gone a long way to help that. So we are, in many ways, I mean, uh, our medical home program now is, you know, most is tremendously rural. A good 60% of it's in rural practices, and people are actively rethinking, reprogramming what they do. But again, it takes different kinds of monies and different kinds of um, of uh, redeployment of resources. You know, we, we periodically still have a pharmacy group that will say, just pay pharmacists to do X or just pay nurses to do Y. And our response has always been, you know, we will pay a medical home environment to do X and a medical home environment to do Y. And we, we, we hope that you would do that work within the medical home rather than to do things like they have in Minnesota and other places where you have storefronts doing medication management therapy that's a silo that's independent of the rest of the healthcare system. Thank you. That was uh, Bill Golden, um, Medicaid Medical Director in Arkansas. Um, so it sounds, I mean, this is sort of a little bit of an extrapolation, um, but do you think this is a step that potentially really is making an impact on the looming crisis in um, pay, uh, primary care um, staffing? You know, we're not, not just physicians, but obviously that, that you know, we're looking to many, you know, creative solutions, and especially with uh, mid-level providers really um, having, uh, taking on more and more of that uh, responsibility. Um, I, think I, I get the sense. I get the sense in some of the practices like, uh, like SAMA in El Dorado, Arkansas, Arkansas Ch Pediatric Clinic in uh, Conway, that the restructuring of expectations and the triaging actually has reduced burnout and increased satisfaction of doctors and nurses. Um, you know, and we do have reports, uh, especially in El Dorado, that people now are asking to be part of that practice. Uh, but, you know, hey, it's, it's anything else, it's evolutionary. It is certainly an improvement over the fee-for-service hamster wheel that we've had in the past. Great. Thank you. Any comments from the faculty about that particular, about uh, Dr. Bowman? I Golden? definitely, in our faculty-focused and clinical staff-focused events, see some synergy between the concern of rising burnout across the professions and uh, the fee-for-service model. And there is uh, emerging evidence nationally to support what he just said, that working better together in a more team-focused environment can actually improve work satisfaction and reduce burnout. And that's a key driver uh, going on um, nationally. So if we, if we can have a win-win there with this movement, I think that adds more fuel to the fire. Great. Well, there, yeah, it's very looking forward to more and more evidence emerging from Arkansas of, about this program. Seeing all your graduates rolling out across the country to, to take care of patients and families. Are there any other questions or comments? Um, so we just have a few moments left. I um, want to take this opportunity to uh, deeply thank our faculty uh, for a wonderful presentation and actually for doing the incredible work that you are doing. And it's really inspirational, educational, and, um, and just in foundational really as we, as we move the uh, team-based care forward. It's really part and parcel of everything that we're doing around primary care and, um, and, and health system reform. So thank you for sharing your wisdom and your experience. Um, as you heard, we do have uh, these slides are, uh, will be available and we'll be actually sending them out to our full collaborative. We'll also be posting them to our uh, website, um, which is a buildbank.org website uh, around multi-state collaborative. You can find it on one of those pages. This has been recorded. So for colleagues who were unable to join us today, uh, they will have an opportunity to listen to the session. And in addition, there are two handouts um, that you sort of uh, saw a glimpse of earlier today in the, um, uh, within the presentation, and those will be going out as well. Um, I just have one announcement. We um, are going to be canceling our uh, webinar for next month. It happens to fall right between uh, the Christmas holiday and the New Year's holiday. And it was pointed out to me that probably very few people will be dialing in during a vacation week. So um, we're going to take that and move that next um, into next year. Uh, the topic was the primary care spend report um, that Bill Beckham had um, uh, uh, 
have published a couple of months ago, and uh, we'll be hearing from the authors of that report. So with that, I really want to thank all of you for uh, joining us today, and especially uh, great thanks to our faculty from UAMF, Alicia Berkemeyer, who is not with us today, um, but has been a tremendous uh, driving force for all this good work. So thanks to everybody, and um, talk to you very soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Really good presentation. Really good program, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Team UAMS, you guys still there? Uh, I am here. I'm just trying to log off and I can't figure out how to do it. <laughs> so what you can do is um, you can stop the recording. Um, okay. Or actually, you know what? If you can give me back the host, I'll take care of everything. All um, right. This is how that works.